All right. So I'm going to give an overview of California strawberry production practices. And there's a lot to talk about here, so I'm going to move pretty quickly, but please stop me at any point during the presentation and ask questions. If you want me to go back, if you want me to slow down, if you have a question about a particular practice, please don't hesitate to stop me and ask. Okay, let's start with weather. California has a really unique climate and it's dominated by this giant Pacific Ocean, especially the North Pacific Ocean. There's a semi-permanent high pressure area in the North Pacific Ocean that moves northward during the summer and then moves southward during the winter. Then everywhere you see blue in this, in this image, there is colder water. And that goes down the coast of California. It's called the California Current. And the water that's actually near the coast in California is colder than it is out to sea. So it's kind of interesting. This is a close-up of the coastline in California showing in November where the cold water is. So you have to go out to sea uh, to be like 10 degrees warmer, the water temperature. Uh, that's in Northern California. And then Southern California, maybe depending on the time of year, somewhere say three to five degrees difference between the coast and out say 100 miles, 200 miles out to sea. Well, that gives rise to some very interesting weather and it makes our weather in California very great for living and very great for strawberry production. Strawberries grow where people like to live. It's a good way of thinking about strawberries. This is Santa Maria and as, go back to this uh, page where you see the, the cold and the warm water. So what's happening is you have this high pressure system that's pushing down and making the air move towards the land. As it moves toward the land, it's going over warm water. Does somebody, uh, could somebody open that door? Uh, it's moving over warm water, and as it gets close to the shore, it will hit this cooler water, and then it will condense and form this fog that you see here, or this marine layer. This is, this is a very typical scenario in Santa Maria. Now, for strawberries, that keeps the weather very cool, which is great for strawberries. We don't like it to get very hot, but also it will also keep it pretty moist. And that moisture, if it turns into heavy dews or fog or drizzle, then that can be detrimental to strawberries because uh, water also gives rise to a lot of fruit rots. When this doesn't happen, and sometimes you've seen uh, where in the in the fall, we get the Santa Ana winds where they're coming from the inland and those winds are pushing warmer air out to sea and that basically turns off the swamp cooler. I think of the swamp cooler as the ocean cooling the air and then that air hitting land and it taking a while for it to warm up. It takes a few miles for sure. When it's coming the other direction, we can have temperatures above 100 degrees here in October. And that's because the air is moving from the inland valleys where it's hotter and it's moving towards the ocean. So it just flips it. That is not the normal situation, obviously. So all this, what you see here looks like water. It's actually plastic and that's strawberry production in, uh, in Santa Maria. All right, here's a map of California and each one of those black squares, so small black squares represents strawberry acres of some sort. And the counties where that is most important are shown here with in, in all caps. So every county with significant strawberry production is actually spelled out. So the county, uh, in Ventura County, we have the Oxnard Plain. We call that the Oxnard District or the Southern District in the, in the strawberry industry. Just north of that, uh, just south of us here in San Luis Obispo is Santa Maria, which is in both San Luis Obispo County and in Santa Barbara County. And then north of that is Watsonville and Salinas, which is also in two counties, Santa Cruz and Monterey counties. In addition to the, to the fruit, now that's just fruit production. In addition to the fruit production, there's nurseries and the nurseries produce the plants. So fruit production obviously produces the fruit. The nurseries produce the plants. Those are necessary. That's how strawberries are propagated. And, and I'll show you what that looks like in a little bit. 
So there are two nursery types. One is low elevation nurseries, and those are located uh, near the towns of Manteca, Turlock, Delhi, in the Central Valley. And they're at more or less sea level, just a little above sea level. Very different weather from the high elevation nurseries, which are up in Siskiyou County and Lassen County and Shasta counties. Those high elevation nurseries are up about 4,200 feet above sea level, very different growing conditions. We get different temperatures at different times of the year, and those are beneficial to what we're trying to do in strawberry production. Okay, so the first thing that happens, and this is gonna get, this slide's gonna get messy. There's a lot of arrows and a lot of labels, so just uh, buckle up a little bit here. I'll try to explain it, but if it, again, if, you, if, if I'm going too fast or you want something explained again, just stop me. So plants are produced at low elevation. That's where the initial increase of the plants is done. It has to start somewhere, and it starts with one little plant in a test tube. And somehow that little plant in a test tube has to become millions of plants that can be planted down in those other districts, right? Down here along the coast. So that starts here at the low elevation nurseries. And then when they get enough of them here, they get shipped to the high elevation nurseries for final increase. Also, there's enough plants at the low elevation nurseries that they can ship plants for summer planting to the uh, coastal areas, first to Santa Maria, then to Oxnard, not to Watsonville because Watsonville doesn't have a summer planting. Only the southern districts do, and I hope that'll become clear as to why in a, in a moment. Okay, so that, that tells you what's happening at the low elevation nurseries. So the high elevation nurseries are where the, most of the plants are produced, and, the, and they'll harvest those plants in, say, September. And the first place they'll go is Oxnard, because that's the first place in the state that we're planting. And then the second place, about a month later, is in Santa Maria. And then about a month after that, they'll ship to Watsonville Salinas. Okay? So that's high elevation, low elevation nurseries. I mentioned that the high elevation is about 4,200 feet above sea level. It's right there on the Oregon border. And there's about 4,000 acres of the high elevation nurseries. And just to give you an idea of the magnitude, the difference, the low elevation, there's about 800 acres. So there's way more at the high elevation. And that's where the final increase, like I said, you're taking, you're getting that final number of plants that you need for planting in these districts along the coast. Okay, so that's kind of messy now that it's done, but any questions? Yes? So the high elevation nurseries Yeah, we, winter or fall planting, because uh, some people call them winter plantings, but uh, it's actually planted in the fall. It's a, but a lot of, a lot of people call them winter. No summer plantings are coming out of the high elevation, right? It's all coming out of the low elevation nurseries. And the reason for that is the timing. So, so this harvest is in September and this summer planting is in like May to July. So that would be a really long time to store those plants, too long. Whereas the low elevation nurseries are harvesting in January. So all they have to do is store them from January until say May, June. That's a lot shorter. And they get stored at, they, they're, they're frozen, right? They're, they're 28 degrees, they're, they're a frozen plant. And that's the way they can store them so long. These plants that come down from the high elevation nursery for fall planting, they're not stored long term. They're stored at 34 degrees. They're intended to be planted within weeks, within a week, within days, really. The, the shorter the distance between or the time duration, the shorter the duration between harvest and planting, the better. So they usually get shipped down from high elevation nursery. They're usually planted that week or the next week. Any other questions about this? It's a lot to think about. I, it took me going to these operations and seeing it to actually kind of put it all together. All right. Yes. Are you going to go over why is high elevation needed? 
let me let me do it now because I don't know if I, if it's in there. The reason that we do high elevation is because of the because you can get the chilling temperatures in September, and the chilling is needed for vigor and growth of strawberries. If you didn't have that, you could grow them at low elevation nurseries, or you could grow them in a greenhouse. But you need the chilling, and you can get that chilling at the high elevation in in time for planting in the fall right so this is all very carefully orchestrated we have all of this all these climatic zones in california where we can do this we can get the and we need like you know somewhere between 200 and 400 hours of chilling and chilling means hours below 44 degrees fahrenheit so that time of year in the fall at 4000 foot elevation you can imagine the nights start getting really cold and uh, hopefully we get enough chilling by say September early September that they can start harvesting sometimes it's a little touch and go we don't get sufficient chilling and we're ready to plant down here and the high elevation nurse users are saying yeah but we don't have enough chilling uh, can you hold on and there's this little bit of a game but most years we'll get sufficient chilling in time for planting as you move up, you don't have any problem with the chilling. It's usually Oxnard that's worrying about having sufficient chill. And then Santa Maria does, and then Watsonville. By the time it's in Watsonville, there's plenty of chill at the high elevation nurseries. But good question. I, I don't know if I touch on that later, so I thought I'd go ahead and do it now. Yes? How old are the plants when they plant them? Are they still young transplants, or are they a little bit older than traditional transplants? How old are the plants when they're planted? They are daughter plants that could have anywhere from a few, a couple, few weeks to a month or two. And so they'll vary in size and I'll show you those plants. Uh, I actually brought some with me. Maybe Julie will help me get those when it's time because I'm tethered here to the, to the stand. Uh, but good point, what, how big are those plants? And I'll show you, we're gonna talk about high elevation and nursery production here and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Any other questions? Great questions, by the way. Yes? You said they're uh, shifting that test tube. Is it like the callus, like that callus tissue? Or? It's a meristem. Oh, okay. gotcha. So they use a microscope, a dissecting microscope, and a scalpel, a sterile scalpel, and they cut the meristematic tissue, which is the growing tip of the young plant. And they take that growing tip and they'll put it on a nutrient auger and then it will reproduce from there. Yeah. It takes a while. And why would they do that? Why would they, why would they produce plants like this? Seems awfully uh, labor intensive. I've got a couple questions. Yes. That's one of the reasons. Yeah, you, you, you get rid of diseases that way, and in particular viruses. We want to make sure those plants are free of viruses because viruses once they acquire once a plant acquires the virus it stays with it and it's going to keep producing daughter plants that are also infected and then you're going to send those plants out for fruit production they're all going to be infected so it's extremely important that what you're starting with is clean planting material and free of virus and there's a variety of ways that they do that but one is the meristematic uh, the meristeming that they do in tissue culture yes So let's assume that you, uh, so the question is, how long is it from harvest of a daughter plant to actual fruit production? You're going to harvest a daughter plant that can be planted immediately. And once it's planted, depending on the time of year, it will, let's say it's a fall planting. You're planting it, say, mid-October. By the time February rolls around, if it's in Santa Maria, you have fruit. You're starting to get fruit. In Oxnard, that's going to happen a little faster because it's warmer, you're planting earlier, so you'll be harvesting, say, in January. And the summer crop will do it even faster because you're in warmer, uh, you're in higher temperatures and the plants really get up and go faster. But you have to have plants that are different in their physiology. You have to have plants that are able to produce fruit under longer days. And we're typically used to this situation where we're planting in the short days they're going through the winter and then they're fruiting early in the spring through the summer 
which is different from planting in the summer and fruiting in the summer. So you have to have different types of cultivars for that. Ones that are day, day neutral. And we haven't, I haven't even mentioned that. And I don't know that I get into it yet, but I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and explain that now. So day length is important to strawberries and for the flower production and fruit production. There are basically two types of strawberries. One is a day neutral, which will fruit regardless of day length. And the other is a short day, which produces its fruit during the shorter days. And the short day varieties are used in the sp for spring production. They'll produce more during that short window than a day neutral will. And so it's a strategic thing. Usually in the Southern districts where the early market is more important, they'll produce, uh, they'll grow short day varieties to capitalize on that early market. And then further north, they'll use day neutrals. They'll use day neutrals in all three districts, but they'll use more short day varieties in the southern districts to capitalize on the early market. Think of it like short days are sprinters and day neutrals are marathon runners. You know, they're, they're going for the distance and a short day variety gets up, produces a bunch of fruit and then quits, all right? All right, well, yes. It would call, some people call them long day. Oh, that is That's the day neutral. Day. Yeah, they'll they'll actually do long day and short day. But the, as far as doing only long day and not short days, uh, they, we don't call them long day. We call them day neutral. Yeah. Good question though. It makes sense, right? If they're short days, why wouldn't there be long days? Yeah. All right. Other questions. Good. This is good. We're uh, we're getting into it. So there's a lot more to talk about. So let's, let's move ahead. Uh, so here's, here's how it starts, right? You have the test tube. You got a little, they've, they've excised the meristem. They've put it on this culture medium, this tissue culture medium and allow it to grow. And when it gets big enough, you can see here, it's, it's a pretty small plant. It needs to get a little bigger than that. Then they'll put it in a pot. And that pot is very carefully watered and, and they have artificial lighting. And it's a pretty small plant. It takes, it takes several months to get this. If you've ever tried to germinate a strawberry seed, it takes a really long time and you get a tiny, tiny plant. Uh, and so this is doing it not from seed, it's doing it from, again, the meristem. But um, these are all clonally propagated. It's a vegetative propagation system. There's no genetic exchange of material. That's done when you have seed of different parents that are that are pollinating each other, uh, or you have a, a donor and a, and a recipient of that pollen, then you get genetic recombination. Once you get the, genetic, the genetics you want, then you can propagate that clonally by meristemming and then growing these plants out and letting them produce daughter plants. So from here, from these, you gotta somehow get, I'm showing you how you get from tissue culture to millions of plants. So you start with one plant, it gets a little bigger, and then you take that one plant, you put it in a greenhouse. you see there's one plant in a bin of sterilized potting soil. That one plant will then produce many daughter plants. Say you get 100, 200 plants in this one bin of soil. Now you've got 200 daughter plants, and from there you can increase even further. And this is all done in these greenhouses where you can keep the insects out. You don't want any aphids in there. You don't want white fly. You don't want uh, thrips. You don't want anything, especially things that could transmit viruses. So they use these uh, greenhouses and they're kept, they're, they're very vigilant about insect control and about uh, keeping these plants absolutely healthy. In the field, you can do this as well, and they, and they do it. Once you have a few plants, you can make a little mound, and you can see these are all separated. These are individual uh, mother plants, and they're trying to just make a bunch of daughter plants from these mother plants. And, and the way they do that is by, is by taking these runners, stolons is the real uh, anatomical term, botanical term. We call them runners because they, they run out, and they'll drop some... Uh, roots on that runner and create a daughter plant. And I'll show you more about that. Okay, now I'm gonna show you a video of planting at 
a nursery. This is like a, if you've seen tomatoes or peppers transplanted, same kind of device, right? You got these little taco shaped things. You put the plant in there and they squeeze and the wheel comes down, inserts it into the soil. These wheels then pack the soil around that plant. It's flat ground. There's no beds out here. So you, you don't need beds. And these guys are pushing the soil up over the plants because they're expecting some cold temperatures. And so they want to just protect those young plants. But that plant, that's a daughter plant. That's the same kind of plant that we're going to plant in the fruit production fields. And I, and I brought, uh, Julie, if you'd grab that bag of plants over there uh, and maybe uh, pass them around so you can see what those plants look like. It, it doesn't look much like a strawberry plant. You've got mowed off stems that are very short and then you've got a bunch of roots and a crown and that's, that's all it is. Those are, that's what we call a bare root transplant or a bare root plant. Okay, so those are, what you see now in this photo is a bunch of mother plants planted with plenty of space in between. This is totally different than a fruit production field because you're not producing fruit. <laughs> That's not the goal. You're trying to produce plants. You're trying to promote runner production and daughter plant production. That's, the, that's, that's, what, your, that's what your game is. That's what your objective is. So you can see these drip lines in between, uh, which they don't put out there until they're ready for the runners to, to grow out and set roots. And then they'll put the drip lines out, turn on the water, and, uh, and then the runners will go out and start to colonize that space. So what you're seeing here are all stolons or runners moving out from the mother plants and starting to produce daughter plants. And so they'll fill in. This will all fill in and eventually it just looks like a lawn. It's a lawn of strawberries. So here's, you know, a, probably a big, 200 acre field of, of, of plant production up at the high elevation. And what this crew is doing is they're removing all of the bloom. It's crazy. They go through there lying on their stomachs and they're picking off all of the bloom and any fruit that they can find. Why would they do that? This is polar opposite from what the fruit producers are doing, right? Yeah, so it's a, it's a, uh, they don't want the plants produ putting too much of their energy into fruit production. They also don't want those fruit sitting around rotting because what's that going to do? It's going to attract a bunch of bugs. They don't really want to pay people to pick that fruit. They can't really, they're not in the business of harvesting and selling it. So they're, they're in the business of producing plants. So here's a video of what they're doing on those. We call them, they look like surfboards. They're lying on these surfboards and they're just going very slowly through the field and they're picking all of the bloom and any fruit that they can find. You can see here, this, this, this worker has a bunch of red fruit in his hands uh, and they're picking weeds, they're picking bloom. You can see a lot of like white flowers here and behind them you don't see any. And they gotta go through every month or so and pull these off to keep the field clean. They just want plants, no fruit. So you can see the, the, the difference in the objectives of the fruit producers versus the plant producers. The plant producers want nothing but plants, the fruit, and they don't want fruit, and the, plant, and the fruit producers want only fruit and not plants. As a matter of fact, all those runners create a problem for the, for the fruit growers because now they gotta go through there and pick those runners off because they don't want the plant putting energy into daughter plants. They want the, those plants to put it into fruit production. So you just completely flip the objective. All right, so once you're at the end of that growing season for the plants, you gotta get those plants out of the ground. How do you do that? That's what this video is showing.
It's like a modified potato digger. And the plants are cut, this wheel cuts the runners. Then all these plants go up this conveyor, this chain conveyor, and into a tumbler. And inside that tumbler, they're removing the soil as much as possible. So you can already see, what would a heavy soil versus a light soil? Would you prefer a light soil or a heavy soil for growing like this? You'd want a light soil, wouldn't you? Because if a heavy soil would be stuck to these roots, that bin would be so heavy, it'd break your forklift. So you gotta be in sandy ground, and, uh, and then that's what you get. That's your daughter plants. Okay, then from here, they load these bins onto a semi, and the semi goes to a uh, trim shed. By the way, the plant production yield, on average, it varies a lot by the, by the cultivar, by the genotype that you're growing. About 380,000 plants to the acre is kind of a, an average overall. Some will produce half a million. So anything below about 200 is probably not worth growing. And there are varieties that they really like, but they don't produce enough runners and they have to just say, hmm, it's not going to work out economically. We can't get this thing to produce enough plants. Just like on the fruit production side, you might have something you really, really like, but it just doesn't produce enough fruit. It really has to yield is, is a super important component, obviously. Yes. You know, I, I heard it like uh, it might be related to the chilling hours, like whether it is, you know, vegetative or, or fruit production. I, I just heard about it. If, uh, you know, they don't have the number of chilling hours. What happens if you don't get sufficient chilling? Yeah, it might go vegetative instead of, you know, producing fruit. So uh, let me repeat the question. Why, why do we need, what happens if you get insufficient chilling? What happens if you get too much chilling? If you get too much chilling, you run the risk of having a plant that is too vegetatively vigorous. If you don't get enough chilling, you have a plant that is low vigor and doesn't produce enough fruit. So it goes both ways. And getting that just right, uh, I don't think there's really great information about this, exactly what the exact number of chill hours needed are it varies by variety and of course the weather is not it's not the same any in any given year you never know what it's going to be because some years you'll have extreme chilling and some years you'll have chilling and then warming and then chilling it goes it fluctuates a lot so every year is different they just have made this general rule of of 200 to 400 hours below 44 degrees Fahrenheit, but then there's some adjustments you make. If it goes too low or too high, you add or, or subtract from those hours. And it's not an exact science, but the general rule is chilling produces vigor. And you get it just right, and you get a nice vigorous plant that will get up and produce fruit right away. That's the basic message. Can you compensate it with uh, the time in the fridge or not? Yeah, that's what we call it. Uh, the question is, can you, can you produce more chilling? Can you supplement what you got in the field by, by chilling it in, say, a cold room? And you can. And people do that. And often that's the case in, say, Oxnard. If they don't feel like they've gotten enough chilling at the nursery, they'll put it in at 34 degrees and keep it there for a week. And that will give them that supplemental chill. Yeah, good point. Um, uh, thank you for bringing that up. So this is what the field looks like. You got it. This was dug or harvested. You just mow it and they just try to stay one step ahead of the harvester, right? You don't want to mow it too early and then have it sit out there for days. You're just going to mow it one step ahead of the harvester. And you can see all this foliage is turning red. It looks like fall colors out there because it's, it's January. This is, this is a low elevation nursery. Okay. Those, those, all those plants, those daughter plants, by the way, the mother plants, they don't want them. They'll leave them in the field. They, get, they want them to be thrown out. The mother plants are old. They have a lot of necrotic areas on them. They don't have the vigor that the daughter plants do. So they want to throw out the mother plants and they want to keep the daughter plants. And this shows that 
trim shed operation. What are they doing at the trim shed? She's going to count 10 plants. And she's got to separate them all because they're, all the roots are intertwined, right? And you can see a little blade here. And uh, it's like a sickle bar mower from, a, from another kind of agricultural implement. Take those plants, count out 10 of them, and then drag it across that blade, cut off the tops. Now you've got a stack of 10. And then they come, they come down and see this, these are all 10s. When they get enough, there's people on the other side that will then put those into boxes like this until you get a thousand plants in one box. And those plants are worth somewhere in the vicinity of 15 cents, 20 cents a piece, depending on the variety, depending on how productive it is, depending on market conditions. But uh, so, a, so a box of a thousand plants is, you know, $150. Those boxes get put onto pallets and those pallets go into either long-term cold storage at 28 degrees where they're frozen, or they get put at 34 degrees and they get shipped immediately for planting. Yeah. That isn't going to give you more chill, right? That's a like, reason to kind of go to sleep. Yeah, that's different than supplemental chill. That's just trying to stop all of its respiration and keep it for as long as we possibly can. But those plants are vigorous when they come out of that low, low temperature storage. Okay, turning now from nurseries to fruit production. Let's get into that. Any other questions about nurseries? Yes. Do they have any like on-site testing to determine if the daughter plants have any diseases? They do. So they'll go, uh, there, there are inspectors that walk the nurseries and inspect the plants to see if there's anything, uh, number one, visually apparent, and then they also take samples and test for virus and nematodes as well. So there is a kind of, there's a certification program that they do at the county level. All right, yes. So we watched, the videos were mainly of like planting mother plants in the field and having them grow daughter plants. But with first, like in the big crates, we said they just put one mother plant in like the big white crate. The, the, yeah, the, that initial increase. Yeah, so that's, you do that before taking it to the field or is that a separate? It's before you go, before you ever go to the field, you're doing that because you want to, before you go to the field, you need, you need thousands of plants to go to the field. And that's only going to give you hundreds. So then those hundreds, eventually, you can, you can increase it pretty fast, but you, know, you, you eventually need millions of plants uh, to, to bring down here to plant. I mean, millions and millions. So uh, I don't know, the, it takes about three years to get there if you, if you really want to plant significant acreage. And when there's, a, there, when there's a new variety that everybody wants to try, there's not enough plants to go around and only certain people will get them. And then if they like them, then they'll say, I want more of that next year. And then the yeah. nursery will plant more. And then they can, they can keep up with the demand at that point. But until then, they're just, they're just trying to get a, a little bit into a few people's hands to try it. And then they'll see what the market demand is for that variety or cultivar. And then they'll grow more or grow less. And I'll show you a little bit of, of cultivar acceptability. I have a really interesting chart to show you how dynamic that is. It's a really, really interesting and difficult thing to do at the nursery to figure out what your customer wants and then to have planted just enough of it so that you don't have too much and you don't sell it and you, don't have, and you, and you leave, uh, you know, if, you're, if you don't have enough, then, then you're not meeting the demand and you're losing money that way. So, the nursery business is really, really challenging that way to meet the, the demand for, for the product that you're growing. Other questions? Yes. Uh, are there still allowed to use uh, methyl bromide over there? They do use methyl bromide at the nurseries. And the reason that they've allowed it is it's under an exemption uh, for disease control because they ship the plants so many places around the world 
and they want them to be clean and free of disease. And so they've allowed an exemption for the nurseries. They do not allow methyl bromide fumigation in fruit fields, only in the nurseries. But that's... Do you not hear about any changes? Like, they want to rule that out either? Or? There's always people that want to rule it out and people that want to keep it. And so far, the people that want to keep it are winning. <laughs> yeah. Um, if, we got, if we couldn't use it, we would use other fumigants and then they would probably be less effective and then we might see more more diseases popping up around the world um, and then we would have to deal with that right so that's that's another interesting um, political ping pong I would say in the industry is is fumigation and what what's happening there and I'll show you a little bit of fumigation technology here in a minute it's five o'clock so yes Yeah, what's the labor supply and or do they bounce around from one growing area to another? The high elevation nurseries, nobody lives up there. The, 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 the labor force is basically transported up there. They live there for the time that they're planting or harvesting, which is a short period of time, and then they go back home uh, somewhere else. Uh, so they don't really have housing. They have temporary housing is what they have. Uh, and I don't know if they, obviously they want to keep a, a labor force occupied all year, but I don't know that the nurseries keep those same people. The demand for them is very high for those periods of time when they need them, and then it just turns off. So I, I don't know, I can't tell you exactly where they go from there, but they might go to another commodity and work for the rest of the year until there's something else to do. I'm not certain. Yes. Actually, no. Um, Do you know? I work at, well, not, I don't know fully, but I, I work at Finney's and, and the dishwasher guy that I've always given the dishes to because I bust there. Yeah. He just announced that he's going to be going away to pick strawberries for a little while. So I assume he's going to. But is he picking, or he's talking about nurseries? I don't know. Picking's different. Picking, there's some picking going on all year. But it's going to, what's happening now is the, is the yield is going up sharply and they're going to be paying piece rate so he'll be able to make much more doing strawberry picking than he would be washing dishes let's say i think that might be what's happening in in that case yeah so people they're very mobile and they'll go wherever the going is best and you can make a lot of money picking strawberries when there's a lot of strawberries to pick and we're and we're getting there right now all right Anything else? We might have to do this in two parts. I don't know. <laughs> fruit production. Okay, so we talked about these, these areas of the state where we produce fruit. And uh, this is how many acres we had last year in California. 40,286 acres. And 32% of that was in Watsonville. 42% was in Santa Maria. And 26% in Oxnard. The thing to remember about those southern districts is they have two planting windows. So they're planting both a summer crop and a fall crop. And that's why Santa Maria has become the largest production region in the state is because of that summer crop, which has become, I think around 36% of the total acreage is in the summer planting. I'll show you uh, that in a little bit. So why, you know, if you think about, there's a strategy behind all of these, uh, these growing districts, and it's based on the weather. So uh, this is 30 year average high temperature for each of the districts. And that top one is Oxnard. And you can see the greatest difference is early in the season. And then the next one is Santa Maria, and as you might expect, then Salinas, then Watsonville. So that difference in the temperature makes all the difference in terms of production. It's gonna be warmer in the south, so you're gonna get earlier production you're going to have the first fruit of the year in Oxnard, and they're going to enjoy the higher price of the low supply that exists at that time of year. So Salinas and Watsonville aren't going to try to compete with that window of opportunity. They're going to let Oxnard have that. And frankly, these companies are growing in all the districts. Many of the companies are. Okay, 
before you plant uh, this doesn't happen on every acre but it happens on some acres and there's this thing called fumigation it happens before planting you have a flat fumigation which is what you see here on the left and then the bed fumigation which is done through the drip irrigation lines again prior to planting you can see there's no holes punched here there's no plants out here they haven't listed any beds and this will show you a movie of the rigs that put out the fumigants so they're laying plastic that plastic is being glued to the plastic next to it so that it's airtight and beneath that plastic are shanks that are emitting the fumigant so this is what the fumigant this is the rig is pulled up so you can see these v-shaped plows underneath there and you can see that there's some lines going there i'll blow this up so you can see better there's actually four little emitters where the fumigant comes out and that is put out into the soil about 18 inches deep and then covered with plastic and the plastic stays there for about 20 to 25 days and what that's doing is it's killing pathogens and weeds that are resident in the soil and it's a, a, a great benefit to the plants to do this if we if we didn't have this we would have much more disease much more weed uh, and we would have to struggle with controlling those things by other means but fumigation is coming under greater and greater attack we lost methyl bromide uh, as a as a fumigant it was determined to be uh, too detrimental to the ozone layer and so that was uh, phased out and we are using the other fumigants that are remaining but those are also being uh, I would say regulated extensively and perhaps someday we won't even be able to use those we, we will have to farm without fumigants and find alternative means of controlling the diseases that fumigation is used for so this is another really interesting area for research we've been searching for alternatives to fumigation for decades and we've come up with some interesting things and when Hussein Ajwa comes at our last lecture uh, you'll hear more about that story it'll be I think very very interesting so I won't go into more detail here I think and save your questions about fumigation unless you have a quick one I could answer um, I think Hussein Ajwa would be a, a good time to pose those questions all right once that's done you're ready to make beds and this is a blister it's gonna take that flat soil and if you have the right soil and the right soil moisture you make these beautiful beds when I see these beds I just think wow if only we could have beautiful strawberry beds like that here at Cal Poly but we have this really heavy clay soil and we can't get a bed to look like that for our life we just it won't behave it wants to form these bricks and it wants to form clods and this guy he's running around he's measuring he's making sure that that guest bed is at the same has the same width as the other beds because the this is all GPS driven so the rigs go turn around and they have to form the other half of the bed and you want to make sure that 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 those two halves make one hole not not anything else not anything shorter or wider because then over over dozens of beds that's going to be a problem right so you want to make sure that everything is spaced uh, perfectly and once you form the beds then many people use a pre-plant fertilizer and what this rig is doing it's going down three beds at a time and every one of those hoses coming out from these these are fertilizer bins every one of those hoses is dropping a band of fertilizer right below where the plants will be planted this is a pre-plant fertilizer not everybody does this but this is a fairly common practice and you can see that all these rigs are out in this field at the same time they're just following each other okay then after the pre-plant fertilizer goes out uh, next comes the drip tape and the drip tape gets put out in this case they're putting out two lines of drip tape per bed so you're going to have four lines of plants on these beds and you're going to have a drip tape between the two outer lines on the on the bed and each time the rigs go over those beds they they firm up the bed and shape them a little nicer and the idea is that 
by the time you get to the plastic laying, you have a really, really nice bed to work with the plastic. And that's what's going to be the next step here. So this, this is called zebra plastic or skunk because it's white or clear in the middle and black on the sides. The black is for the weed control and the clear in the middle is for warming up the bed to get early produ earlier production. The downside of that is you get a lot of weeds under there if you haven't put down some sort of weed control. But look how beautiful those beds are. Just crisp, they have a little peak in the middle. Man, I, I just drool when I see how good those beds are. I really wish we could, we could do that in our soils. Okay, lots of different plastic mulches. The, basically, this is the most popular one in the state. This is the color that is white is used in the summer planting to keep the beds cooler. Uh, we want the beds warmer here. The problem is that when we plant, it can be quite warm. So we can have, you know, uh, October can be, like I said, over 100 degrees in San Luis Obispo, not in Guadalupe. But uh, definitely the white plastic will keep the beds cooler. The black will, this is, the plastic is mostly for weed control and for water retention and also to protect the fruit from any uh, soil and it will prevent uh, a lot of rots. There's a lot of details here about the plastics that we could go into. Uh, I'll leave this on here. I'm not going to go into any more detail than I have already, but it's basically temperature control and weed control is the main reason for the plastics. All right, uh, lastly, the last thing that happens is you got to tie in all the irrigation. How do you do that? You got all those drip lines and those drip lines are tied to that lateral here, the main line, and then these little ties will make it watertight. So this takes uh, quite a bit of effort. It's meticulous work. You, gotta, you can't twist that thing too many times or it breaks. And if you don't twist it enough, it leaks. So it really matters, uh, the person who's doing that. They'll cover that up and that's supposed to last the rest of the season. Once the field is ready, beds are made, plastic is laid, drip tape is all uh, connected, then you can plant. And you just saw the plants, everybody got a chance to see the bare root plants. That's what that is, that's coming directly from the nursery. And this is going to be your growing point. That's going to be the new growth that comes out. So I have a video of what that looks like. This is the hardest work that you do in strawberry production. It's, it's, you're bent over the whole time. Of course, they're doing it right. I do out there and I try to bend my knees a lot. And uh, that's hard on the knees. They've figured that out. You bend at the waist. That's hard for a guy my size too, to bend at the waist. But look at how many people are out there hundreds of people out there planting and you need hundreds of people because you've got to get it planted quickly and it takes a long time to plant it you can see every plant goes in by hand uh, strawberries cost about a hundred to hundred and twenty thousand dollars an acre to grow and sixty percent of that is labor sixty percent of the expense of growing strawberries is labor part of that labor is transplanting the other part is harvesting so in the Southern District, I told you there's four lines of plants on a 64 inch bed. And then if you go and then you get about 26,000 plants to the acre. And then in the Northern District, Salinas Watsonville, you've got two lines of plants. The beds are maybe, you know, somewhere between 45 and 52 inches. And you'll get uh, maybe two lines of drip tape for that. So it's, it's very different. The game, the strategy is different, right? Here you're trying to, increase your plant population because you want to get early production and that's happening when the plants are still relatively small here the game is a longer game you're getting your yield because you're out there for a longer period of time and you want to give the plants a little more space so about 18,000 plants to the acre on this kind of a system harvesting uh, everything is hand harvested. We've been trying to do robotic harvesting, but we can't get it to a robot to do what this person is doing. So you can see here, she's putting the berries in a way that is, is very uh, appealing to the eye. The color is facing out. They're trying to make a presentation in that clamshell. 
And this is not easy to do. Every year I, I give the students clamshells and ask them to pack a clamshell and uh, students don't do a very good job, certainly not on their first try. Uh, so that's how all strawberries are harvested. There are harvest aids that are used. One of them is this Harvest Pro. These go through the field very slowly with the crew so they don't have to keep running out to the edge of the field with the boxes. This is a Mercado, also harvest aid. And then this one right here they call Clifford because of the big red dog book. They call, I don't know, it's a red, red machine. They call it Clifford. Uh, and this one spans many more beds than, than these do. So they just, it's just an efficient way of doing it. Yes? Can you go back a few slides where you saw them actually putting plants into the, the beds? The transplanting operation? Yeah, yeah. So Let me, yeah. You want me to go back there? Yeah, just for a second. Um, right here. So those holes that are, they're planting in, when were those cut? I, just, I didn't catch that part of the slide. I didn't show that. You're right. So there's a wheel with, with uh, tines on it. And, and it rolls around and punches the holes as it goes. I should have put that in here. Right before planting. It, right before, they don't want to do it any, any they want that moisture to stay in there. So it, it happens right before planting and they can do it quickly. They can do three beds at a time and the wheels, there'll be four wheels, each one with, a, with all these tines on it. And as they go down, they've spaced them out somewhere 14, 16, 18 inches. And they, they, they look like the shape of a candy corn, if you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, so they, so they, they, put, a, they put a slit, and that's what you see here. All these, all these slits are from that wheel. And the workers, do they follow that machine? Like, is it really like right after the hole is made? No, they're not that close to it. Okay. Uh, it would be like over here, you know, all these people are planting and then, and then a, a few beds away is the guy punching the holes. Gotcha. Yeah. Good point. I, I, I should have put that in there, actually. All right, so Clifford and uh, here's, here's Harvest Pro. I'm on, the, I'm on the deck of the Harvest Pro filming this. And you can see when somebody gets a, 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 a tray ready for market. This is uh, juice fruit. They'll put that on there and, uh, and then this is fruit that'll go to processing. So as they're picking, some of that fruit isn't fit for the clamshell. It goes into a separate bucket. And then you can see that this stays closer to all the workers, but every worker is working at a different pace, plus the plants to all, don't all produce the same amount of fruit. So they all move at a different speed. But so this, this rig is moving very, very slowly through the field. And on this, on, on this platform area, they're doing the quality control. They're measuring uh, the, the weight of the, of the trays to make sure they meet specifications. And they're also uh, tagging all the workers because they're usually getting paid by the box. So they're, they're counting every box that gets up there. This is the Mercado machine that, this is a smaller machine and it's that tongue that rides in the center of the, of the furrow is guiding it so that it's going straight. And then there's one guy that's just gauging the speed of the rig. And he can use these buttons right here to slow it down or to speed it up. And what this does, provides some shade for the, for the clamshells. And then uh, it's just moving by itself, driven by that tongue to guide its direction. That's the Mercado. And then I mentioned robotic harvesting. There were uh, probably five companies uh, when I started here 10 years ago looking at robotic harvesting. And I don't know if any of them are left right now, but uh, I'll show you one of them. This is Advanced Farm. They, they, they took their technology maybe the farthest. I don't know. Uh, you can see these uh, arms are looking for fruit. They have cameras on them and they have these very soft end effectors looking for the fruit. You can see there's some fruit there. And this thing will, will see it, but then it can't get it. So you can see what a difficult thing it is for these things to not just find the fruit, but to, you see what was, it, there were leaves in the way, so it went down and it got it, but it didn't get, didn't get enough of it. And so it gave up and moved on. So uh, 
part of the problem is when the plants get big and bushy like this the machines can't see the fruit so they need to focus on the early season when the plants are small the fruit are big and they're easier to see um, but i think uh, as far as i know they're no longer trying to do this in california so it remains to be seen if robotic harvesting will be a reality it seemed like it was going to be for a time all of the companies were promising that it would be but it just hasn't gotten far enough along yet to be commercialized yes It's very common for the workers to miss strawberries. So does, is there like a second round of harvesting that goes, like they go through it again, or other people fall behind? With, with the machines? No, not with the machines. I'm talking with the workers themselves. The workers themselves, the idea is for one pass, get it all. And they think they're getting it all, and of course they get more of it when it's easier to see. But when the plants are big and bushy, there's more places for the fruit to hide, basically, and it's, it's not easy to find them. And uh, we try, even in small plots with 20 feet, maybe 20 plants, we try to get every single fruit off of those plants and we don't get them all. You're looking this direction, then you go back this way and you get on the other side of the bed and you'll start, you'll see more fruit. You're like, man, how'd I miss that? So it's not easy and, and they leave a lot of fruit behind. And does that fruit get reharvested? Like, is there another pass of harvesting to put that to juicing and processing or something? If it doesn't rot by the time they go back in. So it's only about a three or four day interval between harvests. So if they didn't get it on the first harvest, by the time they come back, it's probably overripe. And so it wouldn't be worth anything but juice maybe at that point. And then, you know, you, you don't want that. You have rotting fruit in the field, but there's always gonna be some. You can't get it all. It's impossible. And that was part of what the uh, robotic harvesters were saying, hey, the humans can't get it all either. So, I mean, we got to be realistic here. How we want to, we want to get 60% of what humans get, or we want to get 80% or 40%. What's the, what's the goal? That became a big question. It was kind of an interesting one. And I think what I realized was that the humans were leaving a lot more fruit behind than we thought. They weren't getting it all. Maybe 70, 60% when we thought they were getting 80 to 90 yeah all right so i'm gonna have to uh cut this short uh obviously you've seen it picked it gets put into these boxes i have a tray up there that is the standard measure of of yield we measure it yield by the tray that's one tray eight one pound clamshells in a tray um you guys i hope you'll uh take some of these home, try some out here. But uh, this is the standard tray. They get, they're very carefully designed so that they stack in a, uh, maybe we could take out the clamshells and just pass them out per table. You guys can crack them open and sample some fruit. The, the variety here is Fronteras. It's a University of California variety. And uh, it's coming right out of our fields here. They were harvested probably this morning. So they should taste really, really great. You tell me. Um, they get taken right from the field. They get touched once. They get put in that clamshell. And then they go to a cooler. And at the cooler, they get cooled down to a temperature that will, they'll store the longest. Are they any good? All right. That's good to hear. <laughs> um, that's Fronteras. That's a... That's a pretty new up and coming variety. So, uh, not super new, but it's still gaining in popularity. These Mac coolers are forced air coolers. Does anybody know what forced air cooling is? So the strawberry people have really got this down uh, and very efficient at it. Uh, these are showing these uh, inflatable bags that go around the pallets. So there's really no loss of air. Uh, and they can really force all the air through the pallets the way they want it to go through and cool down the product as quickly as possible. I'll show you what that means. This is on the other side of the wall. So this product is coming out of the forced air cooler at temperature that should be uh, the same temperature as the cooler. So in the cooler, you'll see these tarps 
and then this uh, wall here, there's a fan on the other side, and, and the fan is going to pull air through. And uh, what they'll do is put two lines of pallets, they'll put that tarp over top of it, and then it'll suck the air out of the middle, and it'll pull the air through the vents on the side. And the boxes and the clamshells are designed so that that air flows across the product and it cools it down to 34 degrees in this case and that's the way it will store until it's sold at the supermarket here's a cooler full of product this is wow this is a lot of strawberries they got to sell this every day it's not it doesn't always look like this this is probably an oversupply situation but uh, this they got to move this product quickly strawberries don't last very long they want to harvest them and get them sold the same day so overnight maybe but they don't like them to be in a in a cooler for more than a day that's a really bad way to to run your business uh, this is really cool technology that uh, they use for product that's destined for more distant markets and this is what's called controlled atmosphere storage on the bottom is a uh, is a plastic bag and they're taking a a big bag putting it on top and then sealing the two bags together with this wide tape that you see okay so that one just got treated and now this new bag is coming over basically our our air is about 78 percent nitrogen 21 percent oxygen and 0.3 percent carbon dioxide you see what he did there now this bag is gonna it's, it's gonna suck all the air out and then it's gonna push air in after it sucks it out then it pushes a new air in and that air is about 3% oxygen and about 10% co2 so that's roughly you know there's a this is proprietary technology so I don't know the exact gas mixture but that's what they're doing they're taking ambient air and they're raising the CO2 and lowering the oxygen dramatically and that's supposed to slow down respiration and prevent decay so you're getting one to two days of extra shelf life here all right that is I think I'm gonna stop there that's one of them there's lots of coolers that, and all of them have these yeah there's there, it, it was it was one in Santa Maria I think it was Driscoll's yeah yeah yes do they use uh, hydrocoolers in, in strawberry cooling no 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 water you don't want the water to touch the fruit the water is your worst enemy this rain that we're going to get is going to destroy the strawberries that are in the field they're going to be picking them and throwing them away or putting them towards juice because the rain damages the fruit it lays on the plastic it rots it causes little cracks in the fruit if it rains a little bit we can tolerate it and certain varieties tolerate it better than others but if it rains a lot typically they'll go through and they'll strip all the ripe fruit sell it to juice or throw it away and then wait for the next flush of fruit yeah you guys have been great uh, I didn't get through I had probably another 20 minutes here to go through there's some other production systems I could show you some pests and diseases but uh, we had some good questions and that's the important thing is that that you got a chance to answer ask your questions and and a chance to learn something I, 